All right, so we're continuing. Kevot Perikimen Mishnah Tet. It's part of Mishnah Tet. I guess in some books it may appear as a separate Mishnah. The Mishnah actually begins with the words of Rav Hanina Ben Dosa about the importance of Yirat Chet O Kotemet Lechokhmato. As we will be seeing today, Chokhma is something that is very much extolled. In other words, the rabbis, of course, uh, praise and tell us how valuable it is for one to learn, to be a chacham, to be knowledgeable in Torah, as long as he uses it properly. One can become knowledgeable and use the knowledge for the wrong things in the wrong ways. And that is why in order for the chokhmah, which is something very powerful to be of any good use, it is important that there should be yirat chet kotemet lechokhmato, which we explained last week means that the foundation, or, the, or that there should be, a, in first position, a high level of yirat shamayim, or fear of God. In that way, the chokhmah will not mislead us. Wisdom, knowledge is very powerful. It could be used to justify just about anything. And as we explained, if that knowledge is tied down to one's physical instincts, then there, was, there would be no way for him to, uh, to stop himself just with Chochmah. On the contrary, he may use Chochmah to explain why what he's doing is okay. Uh, a lot of Greek philosophers who were big Chachamim in, in philosophy were caught, you know, doing all kinds of things that are not very proper. And they, they, would, say, they would be asked, you know, how could you do something like that? And one of them said, right now I am Socrates the man, not Socrates the philosopher. And there was two lifestyles. One he would preach, right? And one which he would follow because of his desires. And that, that is, of course, uh, not a good example of chokhmah being put to use in the proper way. And, of course, it cannot be put to proper use because there's no yirat chet o. There's no yirat shamayim kodemet de chokhmato. Anyway, so that was last week, and that is really a very important idea in general, because there are many, many Jews who are observant, who are, who are learning Baruch Hashem, and that is very good. But if Yirat Shemaim is not fully developed, it's going to be so lacking. In other words, the Chokhmah will not be mit kayemet. It will not have so much of an impact in the individual's life. He will know things. So what? What will it do for him? That is, what follow, that is why the next part of the Mishnah, or the next Mishnah, is a similar idea, but it talks about Ma'asim. Knowledge is important, knowledge is good, knowledge is expected of people to know, to learn. But more important than knowledge is Ma'asim. Judaism is a religion of deeds, not just of knowing certain things, saying certain things. Right? This is Olam HaAsiyah, as the Kabbalah explains, we're here in this world to do. Hashem put our neshama into a physical body so that we can function in a physical world, in doing things with our hands, with our feet, with our mouth too. So we need to use that body besides for our own personal needs, for observing the mitzvot. So it's not just enough to learn the Torah, one has to do ma'asim. But here he talks about a very interesting idea. He's not talking about just no, no ma'asim at all. He's talking about that it better be that the ma'asim should be greater in number than the chokhmah. So the, many of the commentaries ask, how could ma'asim be greater than chokhmah? I mean, if you, how would you come to the Ma'asim unless you first had Chokhmah? You know, how do you know? What, in other words, you first had to have Chokhmah to know to do the Ma'asim. Various explanations given. I'm not going to get into every one. I'm just going to give you the basic uh, idea of what's going on here. Ma'asim, in reality, the deeds, is, are, or represent the byproduct of the Chokhmah. It is very, very possible naturally, that chokhmah should produce many, many thousands of ma'asim. Very simple. 
So what's the chidush over here? What's, what's the emphasis over here? That whoever's deeds are greater than his chokhmah, chokhmah to mitkayemet, his chokhmah will endure. The chidush, the main point that he's saying here is the chokhmah that one learns hopefully should be put to practice. As we say in Hebrew, tzarich leyasem et ha One has to apply it. Not just learn it, but put it to work. So when we take what we learn and we put it to work, then obviously, when we put all the chokhmah to work, we produce many, many ma'asim. So kol shema'asav merubim chokhmato means an individual whose deeds, his accomplishments in life, are greater, and they should be greater than his chokhmah, because he has put the chokhmah to work. He has applied it. So therefore, he has produced. Imagine a tree that, that produces a thousand mangoes. <laughs> right? It's just one tree with a couple of branches, but many, many fruit can come out, depending, of course, on the, the tree, depending on how many branches. So then that chokhmah mitkayemet, that chokhmah has a purpose. That chokhmah can endure, endure meaning that not only had, has it contributed to all these ma'asim, and as a result of that, that chokhmah is being represented as though it still exists through every single ma'aseh. In other words, the chokhmah is there. The chokhmah is productive. Mitkayemet means that it's alive. How is it alive? It could be seen. Imagine if children and grandchildren go in the ways of their grandparents. So it's like their grandparents are still alive through them. A child, Rabbi Stelis, is an emissary, is a representative, is a continuation of his father. So even once the parent is no longer in this world, the child can in many ways continue to represent the, his father, even though he, he's representing himself too. But there's some continuity. The father or the grandfather lives through the child or grandchild. There's something alive in this world of them. That's beautiful. If not, no Kaddish is said, no Mishnayot are learned, no charity is given. It's, the person is dead, is gone. There's nothing else in here, for, in, in this world for him. What a shame. So Chochmah Kayemet means all that Chochmah continues to exist, continues to produce. It's fruitful, it's productive. V'chol shechochmato merubeh or merubah mi ma'asav, whoever's chokhmah is greater than his ma'asim, means that his ma'asim are few, and his chokhmah is so great because he learned a lot. And chokhmah tomit kayemit, the chokhmah is not productive, it's sterile, doesn't go anywhere. What good does it to anyone, to the individual or to the world, when a person learns a lot, accomplished a lot in learning, but didn't put it to work? You know, it, it's, it's interesting to note that you can have 10 people going to yeshiva. The Gemara actually speaks about it. Many, many students learn in the yeshiva and they all come out different. They all have different uh, tafkidim, different roles, different missions in life. And we're talking about only the serious ones. Even from the ones who are serious, not every one of those 10 becomes a big leader or rabbi of the generation. It takes a certain neshama it takes a certain amount of devotion, right? It takes uh, a certain amount of, uh, of siyata de shmaya, of divine assistance, right? To, uh, to accomplish that. And then, nonetheless, each one may turn out to be something else that is productive in some other way, this different way. One is a teacher, one is a principal of a school, right? One is a, a judge, a dayan, right? One is involved with helping children who, are, who have difficulty in learning. He's not a teacher per se, but he, in the various capacities. And that's okay. Each one is productive. But imagine one going into a yeshiva, learning so much, and not coming out, not a Rosh Yeshiva, not a teacher, not, a, not productive in, with all that he's learned. He's not using it for anything. It's a shame. So, in the end, the chokhmah, what is chokhmah from the Jewish perspective? All it is is an emtsa'i, it's a means to an end. 
it's not the end in itself. And that is the big, big mistake that many people make, especially non-Jews. They see, the Greeks saw Chokhmah as an end. Become knowledgeable. Exercise your faculties, your, your reason, your, uh, your logic. You know, use it to its fullest. Prove that you're smart. That's all about Chokhmah. Nothing about what can the Chokhmah now do. We see what Chokhmah does in this generation. Look at all the creativity in many scientists. A lot of good things, a lot of technological advances, whether it's in the medical field, whether it's in, the, in, in, in space, uh, everywhere, even in the military, <laughs> which is, we, we would rather not, but what can we do you know, to defend ourselves? So that takes creativity. There's Baruch Hashem a lot of creativity. Hashem, of course, has to enable all of that to happen. So Chokhmah produces. For us, Chokhmah, therefore, is a means for a Tachlit. And what is the Tachlit? The Tachlit is Ma'asim, Ma'asim to Vim, good deeds. If Chokhmah leads to Ma'asim, then it's good, it's fruitful. If it does not, it doesn't lead anywhere. As I saw, I think I've seen various uh, Meshalim, various expressions used to describe what is it like when a person learns a lot and does not produce? One of, one of the mishalim, one of the ways we can compare it to is to somebody, imagine somebody seeding his field, right? The seed, he plows, he seeds, everything grows, and he doesn't harvest it. What a waste, no? <laughs> seeds, and lets it rot. You worked so hard, why don't you harvest it? Zorea velo kotzera, as the rabbis tell us. As somebody who seeds and does not harvest. What a shame. I prefer this example than the other example that is also brought, which I'd rather not mention, but if you want to know, <laughs> there is another mashal brought of somebody having kids and burying them. Bringing them? So I'd rather not use that one. But either way, you know, you're working so hard, you're doing something, do it right. Do it for its ultimate tachlit. Chokhmah, the ultimate tachlit is for one to do ma'asim, not just to learn. So that is the meaning of chokhmah, chokhmah tomit kayemet. The chokhmah will endure, means that it has continuity. It, it, it lives on through the ma'asim. Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, Said, a uh, said it very beautifully in describing the Chokhmah of the Greeks, that they are like a flower without the fruit. You know, you have some flowers, some trees that give out a flower, just a, 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 a blossom, without the fruit. So it may look nice in the way they present it, all that Chokhmah, but no fruit comes out of it. I can't enjoy it anymore. I can't eat it. I can't, you know, do anything with it. Chokhmah, without being put to, to, to use, is a waste. Next Mishnah, Mishnah Yud. Hu haya omer, kol she ruach habriyot nocha hemeno, ruach hamakom nocha hemeno. Very, very interesting idea. How does, how does one know if Hashem likes him? Wouldn't it be nice if we can tell if Hashem approves of our ways, of our deeds, He's unhappy with them. There are several ways, actually, that one can figure that out. There are several ways. I don't know if we will go through every one, depending on our time. One way is what this Mishnah says. Mishnah says that, look at people. Do people generally, in general, approve of Him, like Him, have only good things to say about Him? then that's indicative that Bashamayim, they're also happy with him. On condition that it's, they don't like him because of his money. You know, there are people, of course, who have a lot of good things to say about some because they want to flatter him, because they want some, interest, some favor of him. They have an interest in him. We're not talking about those kind of examples. It has to be pure, sincere, genuine respect for someone. If the general populace, the general community, pretty much looks up, respects, likes an individual, that should be usually an indicator that Bashamayim, they're happy with him too. Now, 
It could be that the, in this individual who's a nice person is not religious. Well, obviously, you know, they have a, they have a cheshbon with him, they have an accounting with him concerning the fact that he's not fulfilling his obligation. But here we're not talking about the balance sheet so much. We're talking about the individual. It, it's a big, di it, it, there is a big difference. Mitzvot and Averot, of course, you know, it's a, it's a factor that may, may have to do with his knowledge or lack of knowledge of the Torah, depending where he grew up, right? Imagine, I mean, uh, growing up in Bam, you know, that place that was destroyed by an earthquake. Obviously, there must have not been Torah there, right? In Bam? I don't think any Jews lived in Bam, no. <laughs> right? So anyway, obviously, if somebody grows up in a place that he doesn't know, it's not completely his fault. It doesn't mean he's excused. They, they send him back down. I mean, they have a way of dealing with him. But here we're dealing with the individual. Is he a nice guy? Or is he somebody who's not such a nice guy, a nasty guy? Well, what, what, you want to know what they think? Look what people say. It's pretty much a mirror image. And this is similar to what Michelet says when you want to know what somebody thinks of you. you. Does he like you or not? Well, what do you think of him? It's pretty much a mirror image. I mean, some people are maybe more intense, more devoted, but generally speaking, after people know each other for a while, what they think of the other individual, that individual thinks of them. So you can have a rough idea of what uh, someone thinks of you, what you think of him. So here, what do they think, Bashamayim? What people th think of him. If people approve of him, people are happy with him. Look at the wording here, Ruach Abriot Nocha. It doesn't say Ohavim, that they like him. It doesn't say any other words except for Ruach. Those people find him pleasant. And that is why we, that's why these words are referring to personality, not money or anything else that they like him for. They like his personality. They feel he's a pleasant person. Ruach HaMakom Nochaim, you know, then Hashem likes him too. Hashem, in other words, he's pleased with him. Chol she'en Ruach HaBriot Nochaim, you know, if people are not happy with someone, a lot of people have something to say about him, not good. En Ruach HaMakom Nochaim, you know. Now, Hashem obviously is unhappy too. Now, you could translate, by the way, you could interpret this to be Hashem says, oh, all these people have something nasty to say about you, then I'm not happy either. In other words, it doesn't necessarily have to be a mirror image. It could also be, you're making a lot of people upset. So Hashem will be upset. You could also say that. But the simple meaning of this Mishnah is that it's an indicator. Down here, they have a lot of criticism about someone. You can bet that upstairs they're very, very upset too. They have a lot to say about this individual. All right. Now, the immediate question that one can raise is, wait a minute, it's impossible to make everybody happy. Right? It says so Megillat Esther. At the end, Mordechai HaYehudi Ratsui Lerov Echav. Mordechai was only, uh, was very well liked, but the majority of his brothers, it says the majority, not everyone. There's always some criticism. Right? Why didn't he do it this way? Why did he do it this way? You know, people always talk. So to make from the Megillah, you learn a very interesting point. You cannot make everybody happy. Okay, so what do you do? So there was a father who told his son before he passed away, he wrote a tzava'ah, he wrote a will. Listen, it's impossible to make everybody happy. Therefore, I recommend you make Hashem happy. <laughs> and if you make Hashem happy through your deeds, He will make it so that they will be happy too, that you will be able to please everyone too. In other words, Make an effort, invest on making a Shem happy. You know, you make a wedding, let's say. You make a big party, a bar mitzvah, whatever it may be. Some event. And, you know, people have something to say about everything. Oh, he was cheap on this. Or he didn't bring this. Or this didn't come out right. There's always going to be some criticism. You can't make everybody happy. So because that's a fact, don't try. Don't try too hard. Don't try too hard to make everybody happy because that's impossible. Instead, as the father told his son, focus better on making Hashem happy. So when people have a complaint, 
you know, it happens to me too, you know, when I hear all kinds of things about people saying all kinds of things about all kinds of people, situations, I said, you know what, I'm more concerned with what he has to say. Not what everyone has to say, you know, it's just, not everyone, you know, is very informed about this particular situation, and even if they are informed, maybe they don't have the right way of looking at it or judging it, so therefore, you know what, I focus or concentrate my efforts on making him happy. If I did that, I'm, I'm happy. And here the father is telling the son, if you do so, he will make it so that everybody will be happy. So good. So don't try to make the whole world happy. Even though, as we will soon see, it is important to do our best that people should, of course, not have anything bad to say. In other words, one does have to please, one does sometimes have to go out of his way to uh, make people feel comfortable, at ease, uh, that they, they should not judge him negatively. Don't, be, don't put yourself in a situation where people will suspect you of doing the wrong thing. In other words, you have to be careful. You can't have, one cannot have the attitude, I don't care what people say, what people think. That's also no good. I do, Hashem knows the truth. Well, that's true. Hashem knows the truth. But don't make it too obvious or don't make it don't put yourself in such a situation where you really raise people's eyebrows. You know, <laughs> you know what's this? He said, no, Hashem knows the truth anyway. There's halachot about marit ayin, about people giving the wrong impression. You don't want people to learn the wrong thing, especially if it's a halacha. When they don't see clearly what's going on, and they don't know what you're doing. So there has to be a little bit of transparency, as we say it in English. In, in what people do, so they shouldn't lead to suspicion and negative vibes, negative and criticism. Yeah, as much as possible. This fits in with another another rule or cloud that the rabbis tell us in the Gemara that the bottom line in life: some people succeed and some people fail in their relationship with other individuals. Why? Because masecha yekarbucha, masecha yerachatucha. In the end, this is what basically defines people's success or failure in relationship. Uh, and it could be at home too. Maasecha yekarvucha, maasecha yerachakucha. What that means is, it, in the end, it's your deeds that will determine whether you will be close and friendly with people. Maasecha yekarvucha. Or maasecha, your deeds will determine if you will be distant and far from people. People will not want to associate, people will not be, want to be partners, people will not want to talk to you, invite you. What is it, that, what does all these things depend on, for the most part, on ma'asecha? If a person is nice, a person invites others, a person is considerate, then people, you know, see it, they notice it, they appreciate it, and they reciprocate. That's what, it, well, that's what the word in English reciprocate means. Yeah, you're nice to them. Now here's a, here's a tricky one. Here's a very, very tricky question. You're about to make a wedding, okay, and you have a list of people you're going to invite. There's someone that you know. In the past, perhaps, he invited you too. At the last wedding that he just made, he didn't invite you. So you're sitting with your wife, and you're about to scratch off this name. From your list. No, he didn't invite me, I'm not inviting him. Is that the right thing to do? Yes or no? No. no. Well, if you say no, why not? Maybe he doesn't want to be your friend anymore. I mean, that's why he scratched out, that's why he didn't invite you. He obviously is working, like most, most people are working, with a list because you can't invite the whole town and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to feed them for one night. You really have to be careful. When it comes to a wedding, it's a big expense. So you have to cut your numbers, especially if you have the son or the daughter or whatever, and uh, they tell you, listen, you're out of town. You, we only allow you to invite 50 people or whatever it is, you know. So sometimes you may have to cut the numbers of people who you would ordinarily want to invite anyway. But this situation is a little bit different. Why? Because he didn't invite you. So somebody said no. Okay, but what would be the reason for the no? 
I guess the, the normal reason to say no is because uh, he's still a friend. You consider him a friend. He's on your list you know, just because he didn't invite you. But some people will say no. I don't hate him because he didn't invite me. I just, if he doesn't invite me, why should I invite him? What most people forget, however, and this is really why I, I present this question, what most people forget is that it's very possible, at least a 50-50 chance or more, that the reason why he didn't invite you is either he forgot, he forgot, that's a possibility, or number two, he was limited to who he can invite, but had he not been limited, he would have invited. Or something else came up, you know, that he just couldn't invite. He made a mistake. He thought that somebody was in Ev Avelut still. Who knows? There is always the possibility that he did not intend not to invite because he does no longer want a friendship. So what happens when the person reciprocates that and says, I'm not inviting either, he is perpetuating a sinat chinam, a baseless hatred, a hatred that shouldn't exist. It's not even there. It's a mistake. He forgot. And now when he says I, he didn't invite him, he's going to be upset. You know, why, what happened? Well, you didn't invite me. Hopefully he's tactful enough and doesn't tell him the truth. <laughs> but if he tells him the truth, you know how, you know what this could lead to? He could be upset at his wife, the guy who didn't make the mistake. Why didn't you put it in? That could lead to a, another fight. Yeah. But Chafetz Chaim was very, very careful whenever he ate somewhere, only to say good things about the soup and the food. Because many times there was a maid, a helper in the kitchen. And if somebody, as, as it has happened with him, said he could use a little bit more salt, that cook was at risk of being fired. So the Chafetz Chaim being so sensitive Admonish the guy, how could you even say that? Keep your mouth shut. The soup is great. And he went to the kitchen, and guess what? He was right. The, the, the owner, the landlord, was telling the cook off. You know, it's Chafetz Haim knew human nature very, very well. He was sensitive to that. So if you're sensitive, you have to be very careful what to do or what to say in these kind of situations. Yeah. What may happen is you will invite him and he may not come if he doesn't want a friendship. That, you know. As it is, there's a percentage of people that won't come anyway for other, other reasons. So I gave you an example of a tricky situation that happens all the time. That, you know, it, 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 it ties into what we just said. You have to be careful. In the end, it's our ma'asim. If we tend to fight with people, I'll sue you, I'll see you in court. All right, it can, it can happen once in a blue moon that you have no choice but to go to court. You try to settle things. You try to deal with them in a, in a, in a better way. A person who insists on his way, a person who is difficult, a person who's always angry and aggressive in his ways and not tactful, ma'asecha yirachakucha. Those kinds of ma'asim, people don't want to deal with that kind of a person. Person who's nice, gentle, kind, he invites you, smiles. Masecha yekarbucha. In the end, it all has to do with masi. So that is why the rabbis tell us that one should always be mishtadel, latzet yede abriot, latzet yede shamaim, latzet yede abriot. In other words, you want, you want to make an effort to not only please Hashem, but please people. You know, with as much as possible, you can't always 100% do so, but lishtadel, latzet yedei abriot as well, that people should not have something negative to say, a uh, wrong impression of us, which many times comes from misunderstandings. Lishtadel latzet yedei abriot, yedechovat yedei abriot, that people should be uh, uh, approving of, of this individual, that they should have something good to say. Or as the Pasuk says in Mishle, you know, to make an effort, Limtsochen Vesechel Tov Bene Lokim Veadam. You know, it was to find favor and grace in the eyes of God and man. Right? In the eyes of God, of course, but also in the eyes of man. In other words, not to say, no, I don't care about them. 
sometimes, yes, sometimes you can say, listen, you know, I can't worry about them too much. That's fine. But not to say, I don't care at all. Because you want people to say something good. You want people to approve. You want people to, to feel good about you. All right, next. Rabdosa ben Harkinas Omer, Shena shel shacharit v'yain shel tzahorayim v'sichat ha'yeladim, v'yishivat batek nesiyot shel ha'me ha'aretz, mozi'im et ha'adam in ha'olam. Very interesting Mishnah. Rabdosa ben Harkinas, let me give you a quick, just a brief introduction. He was a man who had longevity. You know, was he, he was a man that lived a long time. I don't remember the exact age, if it's brought down, but he, herich yamin, he lived long. And here he talks about life, but not just life. He talks about certain things that he dis very much discourages in life. You know, people want to enjoy life, fine. People don't want to be stressed, go on vacation once in a while. Everything, we've already learned this, everything that is in moderation is good, C can be good. Lately they're saying chocolate is good for you. It's, it, 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 whoever eats more chocolate does not have as many strokes. But even at the bottom, you'll read, just don't overdo it because it has a lot of fat and sugar in it. <laughs> I wonder who paid for that advertisement, the chocolate company. <laughs> Everything in moderation is okay. So he comes and says, you know, there's certain things that you really, really got to be careful if you're not moderate about them. One of them is sleep. Shenasher shacharit, oversleeping in the morning? Yain shel tzoharaim, wine in the afternoon? These are examples of things that really mess up your time, mess up the day. And not only mess up the day and the time, they destroy a person's potential. Every a human being has a certain potential that can be expressed, that can come out, if he allows it to. And here are things, he's telling us, here are certain activities that will stop that potential from coming out, from developing. Oversleeping is one. Oversleeping in the morning. The morning is the best time to accomplish when we're fresh, after we've slept, and hopefully we slept enough. So why wake up at 11 o'clock in the morning? Not only are you missing shachrit, kriyat shma, and all that, to get a late start. What does a late start mean? A late start means that you went to sleep late last night. That means what were you doing late last, staying up late last night? So, and it, this can become a cycle, a way of life for a lot of people. This is no good, he says. Shana shal shachrit, shana is, is sleep, which is important, but in moderation and overdoing it in the morning is a big mistake. Same thing with yain shal tzoraim. Yain is good, it's healthy, especially if you're older, to have red wine, yeah. But not in the middle of the afternoon. What's gonna do, what is it gonna do to you in the middle of the afternoon? <laughs> it's gonna put you to sleep. You know, it happens to me sometimes that I'm very, very tired in the afternoon, especially after you eat. Yeah, the food makes you tired. So I go lay down, so I go rest a little bit, and, and I feel bad that I need to even think about it because I know that I need the, the time to do something else. Time is so precious. So, you know, I walk around a little bit, I get up, and then I sit down, I say, wait a minute, that's, where's that all that sleep? All of a sudden, I don't feel that need anymore. So sometimes that need, is momentarily, it eventually goes away. It doesn't mean you should not get sleepy. If a person doesn't sleep enough, it's not healthy. But yain shal tzoram is not such a good idea because it will put you to sleep at a time when you did not plan on sleeping. So what I suggest, instead of yain shal tzoram, have another cup of coffee. <laughs> does tea do the same thing, Michael, as coffee? I guess so. It does it wake you up? The Persian tea? Yeah. The caffeine? Because they tell me the caffeine of tea and coffee are different. Huh? So you make it strong. Coffee is stronger. Yeah, with some baklava. There you go. Yeah. That's <laughs> that makes you up. Tea has thin in which has a relaxant also. It has a relaxant too. Yeah. Okay. So before you speak to somebody that you're angry, you take the tea. So. <laughs> what, else is, what else kills the, the, the potential? Sichat yeladim. Sichat yeladim? Yeah, talking to little children, playing with them. What's wrong with that? I mean, you want to spend time with your kids. We're talking about little children here. You know, go to the swings. 
talk to them, play with them. Yeah, but be careful you don't overdo it because that's totally irrelevant, a waste of time. See, what's that going to Where is that going to do for you? So a person who overdoes that, sichat yeladim, is making a big mistake. Next, v'yishivat batek nesiyot shalamei aretz. The next one is sitting or getting together with an assembly, with a group of people who are ignoramuses. Amei aretz, people who all day long, all they do is play sheshbesh, right? Backgammon, cards, talk politics, have a beer, have a smoke, you know. Idle people have nothing to do with their life, don't care so much about accomplishing. Being with them is the wrong, is the wrong crowd to be with. They're not going to stimulate you. On the contrary, they're going to just waste your time. And, and, and all that time is so precious, it's going to go to waste. All that potential that every one of us has will not be used. It will not come out. So these are activities that Rabdosa ben Harkinas tells us they neutralize, they, they, they basically neutralize us. In other words, they, they, they freeze us, they paralyze us from being able to be who we can really be. I gave you the, in the introduction that he lived a long time. Why? Because it's possible since he was a very old man when he said this possibly, he was even talking to senior citizens. Hey guys, what are you doing? Just watching TV and waiting for the for the Hebra Kaddisha to pick you up. <laughs> you, know, well, well, you know. Okay, so you're over 85. Okay, 86. Very nice. Baruch Hashem, you have good genes. Or you have some zechut. And Baruch Hashem, you're, you're watching your weight. But what are you doing with all that time now that you're retired and collecting Social Security and so forth? What, what does a senior citizen do with As long as the head, of course, is still active and the mind is still working, there's a lot that can be done. Today there's so many shiurim that one can listen, you know, even while he's walking. What a good way of maximizing the time. If you're going to be walking for half an hour, 45 minutes, you know, no big deal. So he's talking to them too. Be careful. You don't, there's no reason for you to sleep that much. The older you are, the less sleep you need. And you want to drink wine? Drink it at night, not in the afternoon. All of these things, motzi'im et adam in haolam. This is a very hard expression. We've seen it before. Motzi'im et adam in haolam can mean one or two things. Either they remove one from the olam, meaning from the tachlit, from the ultimate purpose. They remove him for here where he should be focused. Or literally, they can shorten his life. Hashem says, hey, you're not, you're not doing what you should be doing. What they all have in common, however, is that they kill a person's potential from being views properly from being what it could be. In, in, instead of using it for something productive, instead of devoting his time for something that has meaning, he's just wasting it, either through sleep or through playing around, not doing what he should be doing. All right, next Mishnah. Rabbi Azar, Amodai Omer, Amechalel Takodashim, this is a very powerful Mishnah, powerful words. The Bil Azar Hamodai, who himself was killed by Bar Kokhba, I believe it was, because of somebody accused him wrongly of being with the enemy. He says something very, very powerful. Anyone who is disrespectful, mechalel, disrespectful, or actually the, 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 right, the right translation is one who desecrates or profane, or is it the word to profane? Something like that. The Kodashim, that which is holy, mevazet or he is disrespectful of the holidays, not necessarily the Yom Tov itself. Here it means holamoed. Cholamoed, as you know, is the days between two holidays. Like Sukkot, we have Cholamoed. Pesach, we have Cholamoed. Those days are semi-holidays. They are holy days. And work is permissible. Certain work is permissible. So some people treat it as an ordinary day. They're being disrespectful of it. That's what he means over here. 
or an individual who, who is malbin pnei chaveru barabim. He puts his friend to shame in public, not just to put him in shame, he puts it in public. You know what the difference between malbin and mevayesh is? Mevayesh means to embarrass. So what does malbin mean? To put someone to shame. What's the difference between putting to shame and embarrassing? The word malbin comes from the word lavan, white. Halbanat panim is so painful and so shameful that the rabbis tell us when you look at a person who's going and experiencing this kind of shame, all his red blood cells have left him and white and he has become pale. So you're looking at him, he has become pale. It is considered like you murdered him. You've taken out, you've drained him of his blood and that's why he looks this way. The person is embarrassed, he looks red. Here, he looks white. Have you seen white fire? It's hotter than blue, hotter than red. It's white. It's, it's more extreme. So when it comes to shame, this kind of a shame is the worst kind of shame. And it's in public? Phew. Next, any one of these acts, or mefebri toshel of Ram Avinu, one who's, who does not respect the covenant of Ram Avinu. What's that? That's the Brit Milah, one who does not want to be circumcised, or one who wants to cover up or undo the circumcision. Or, Megale Panim Torah Shelok Halacha, one who teaches Torah not according to the Halacha, interprets the Torah not according to the real interpretation. He teaches some bogus meaning about some mitzvah, some pasuk. All of these acts, if they're performed by an individual, even if this individual, he has Torah, he learned Torah, and he has good deeds. He will not have a share to the world to come. These are such terrible ma'asim, and we have to explain this why, that a person who does not repent, of course, as long as he did not repent, he will not have a chelek le'olam ha'pa share to the world to come. What, what did he do already? Anybody who repents on time, of course, that's different. To repent for certain deeds, however, is very difficult. Here we're talking about something very, very serious. And we're not talking about Tavot anymore. Tava, a person can claim the Yetzara beat me. He defeated me. I stumbled, Hashem Yishmor. No, what can we do? We have a yetzara, we have the evil inclination, people make mistakes. Okay, we try to fix it. This is not Tavot. Rabbi Azara Modai is talking about acts, deeds, behaviors that are more in line with apikorsut, with heresy. A person who's mechalel that which is Kodesh, desecrates that which is Kodesh, holy, He's disrespectful of the holidays. He doesn't want the Brit Milah. Interprets Torah Sheloke Alacha. And even the other one, Malbim Pnecha Barabim, to put someone in shame in public, all of these have something more in common with heresy. Apikorsut, Kfira. There's no excuse for this. There's no, you don't have an urge, like with Tava, to do something. Some people like money. Some people like women, some people like to drink, some people like drugs, some people like sleeping. There's a ta'ava. This, this is not a real ta'ava. This is heresy. That kind of disrespect for that which is Kodesh, for the sacrifices, right? There's all kinds of ways that one can be mechalel the Kodesh, you know, with tum'ah, doing something with, the, the, you know, that uh, you should be careful with betarai, and you you're not careful with it. You make it tame, or that or you embezzle. Embezzle meaning, in other words, you benefit from that which is kodesh. Or you, there's all kinds of things that one can do to make that which is kodesh mechulal, to treat it as though this is not holy. And this could be not necessarily with korbanot, even though here it's talking about kodashim korbanot. It could be with anything. Anybody who's desecrating that which is holy being disrespectful of the holidays. In other words, he interprets the Torah in a way which is totally wrong. So all of these are so disrespectful 
either of the human being with Albanat Panim putting to shame or with the Torah or that which is holy, that even if you learn Torah and Yad Masin to be Sedaqah, Ches and all that, Elo Chelev Olam Abba, that's how bad it is. Now, of all of these, you know which one people have to pick here and be extra careful with these days or any days. The one that is, that can, that can shalom happen to almost any individual, but that is Malbin Pnei Chavero Barabim. Putting someone to shame. Today you don't have really have Kodashim unless you consider certain things holy. Okay. Mo'adot you could have, but somebody's not going to do it intentionally. So, Megale Panim Batora Shelo Kalacha. Maybe if he's a reformed Jew uh, and he calls himself a rabbi and he gives his own interpretation, but then he's not really uh, he's not really in in line with the Torah to begin with that we would consider his actions. He's, he's a reformed. It's like a different religion. So it would have to be somebody who's a religious, somebody who knows the Torah and megale panim Torah and teaches the wrong halacha, because then we, it would be a concern. Someone who's not religious and teaches Torah not according to halacha, I mean, he just doesn't know any better. So the one that really stands out that people unfortunately don't take it so seriously, and it happens, is alpanat panecha chaveo barabim to put people to shame in public. Be very very careful with this. An additional reason of being careful with this one is because this one is so difficult to fix. Because to properly fix it, you have to say, I'm sorry, in front of the, all the people who were present the first time. Go find them. You don't even know who they are. If it was in a place, in a public place, how are you going to find them? What if he died? You have to go to the grave and ask Mechila. This is difficult. And the Rambam, by the way, brings a list in Ilchot Teshuvah of all kinds of individuals who will have a difficult time doing Teshuvah because certain midot, chunot never certain characteristics, or certain ma'asim, certain deeds or actions, are simply very difficult to get rid of. Some people are in the, have a certain habit, and because of that habit, right, they, 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 they just can't overcome it. So if somebody has certain habits, I, mean, I don't have the whole list here in front of me, but the Rambam brings them, that he can't uh, overcome, it's going to be difficult for him to do Teshuvah. Does that mean it's impossible? No, nothing is impossible. Everything is possible. The word impossible does not exist when it comes to Teshuvah. But it's much more difficult to expect him to do it, especially on his own. So these, these are situations that are similar. Here he's not talking about Teshuvah per se, he's talking about Elo Chelem But if he did Teshuvah, obviously we accept him. The point, the problem is that these are so difficult that will he ever think of doing Teshuvah? I mean, one of those guys who really has a hard time is the one who makes fun of everything. He's a mocker. Mitlotzetz. He's a mitlotzetz, letzan. He makes fun of everything. If he makes fun, do you think anybody can rebuke him? He's going to make fun of the rebuker. How will he ever therefore think of doing Teshuvah? He, he makes fun. He thinks everything is a joke. That's just one quick example of one of those on the list. Yeah, so here we're talking about, obviously, difficult ma'asim, not ta'avot. And if he does not do teshuvah, he's going to lose, he may lose his olam abba, chaz So therefore, these are concepts or actions that one has to be careful to neutralize, whether they're characteristics, whether they're beliefs, that they should not interfere with his life. There's certain midot, you know, that simply that it, it, aggra it, it, it just aggravates all kinds of things, all kinds of behaviorisms. I'll give you quick, two quick, maybe I should give you two quick examples. <laughs> one, of, one of my favorite one is in Mishlei. Mishlei talks about an individual who's called a nirgan. If you ask an Israeli today, do you know what a nirgan is? It's not a common word used in Hebrew. Even though once you describe it to him, he said, oh, I know many people like that. <laughs> What's a nirgan? Nirgan is a combination of a nudnik and an ungrateful person. A, nu a nudnik is another Hebrew word for someone who's always, what's anybody know how to say nudnik in English? He's always sticking his nose, right? Uh, but it's not really nudnik in this case. It's a kvetcher. In Yiddish, a kvetcher. A nagger. Huh? A nagger. Thank you. 
That's the word. He nags. He whines. That's part of it. Now add to that, he's also nashukr. You know, he's ungrateful. Huh? So you have fiutova and a nag. What does that mean? He's the guy that no matter what you do for him, he's never happy. He's always complaining. He's never, you know people like that? Have you met people like that? I hope not. <laughs> they exist. <laughs> Yeah. You know somebody? Like that? Yeah. <laughs> no matter what you do. And you know what Mishlei says up to him about this individual in different words? He's a lost case. You know, I would be careful to never say on anyone a lost case, but a Nirgan is one of those individuals that is you can't help him. He's such a difficult person. You can't make him happy. No matter what you do. He's always whining, he's negative, and he's ungrateful for all the good that you did. The, just leave him alone. The difficult case, Nirgan. Then there was another one. Yeah, the other one that Raman brings down is someone, for example, that invites himself over to a family. He knows that this family is poor, that they barely have enough food for themselves. And he invites himself anyway. So unsensitive, so evil in a sense. You know, a person who can think of doing something like that, I mean, well, I don't know if there are that many people like that, but imagine somebody who knows the situation and just doesn't care. You know, it's very, uh, very difficult to correct. You know, you really got to do a, a complete rehabilitate him, you know, change his brains, you know, and, and his heart do a massive organ transplant to him, you know. <laughs> how could you think, of, how could somebody be like that? So the Rama brings certain individuals who behave in certain ways, so because of that they have a hard time changing their ways. But it's not impossible. Here, however, we were dealing with Maasim, that a person should be very, very careful because he can lose his olama by even if he's good elsewhere. Okay, one more Mishnah. What, yeah. What was that statement about white in the face then? What's the reason for white? Because he's so in shame that the red is no longer there. The red has become white. It's like you drained him of all his blood, like you killed him. I mean, it's worse than even It's worse red, than red. red. The red is already gone and replaced by whiteness. He's become pale. So it's, the rabbi says, if you, it's, it's like you drained him of his blood, like you killed him. That's how bad it is. Yeah. It can happen. Yeah. All right, just one more Mishnah. Short Mishnah. Rabbi Ishmael Omer. During the days of Rabbi Ishmael, and even especially before him, too, all along, throughout the, ta throughout the Tanaim and the Moraim time, there were different schools of thought uh, of how to deal with students, how to deal with hard people. You had Hillel Shamai, the famous example of Shamai being strict, Hillel being compassionate, easygoing, understanding. Different attitudes. And both attitudes are sometimes necessary. Not that one is right, the other one is wrong. But when it comes to inspiring people, when it comes to being mekarevotam, you want to bring them closer to Judaism, you have to, you have to be careful with how you deal with them. Uh, the, tendency, the tendency is to use Hillel's approach. As he says, you know, be from the students of Aaron, we learned, you know, oev shalom, rodev shalom, oev tabriyot mekarvan Torah. You want to love people, you want to care about people, they see that, they come to you. Generally, that's true. There are, with, there are certain people that you have to go with, um, you know, you're going to go to Gehenna, you know, <laughs> this is going to happen to you. Yeah, there are people like that, but not, not everyone. You have to be careful, you don't want to scare anybody. <laughs> but there are people that need that kind of uh, rebuke, that nothing else helps. You're nice to them, it doesn't get through. So there's, there's of course, a time for everything. So here Rabbi Ishmael tells us also, in general terms, he says, you're better off being easygoing, an easygoing person. What does it mean to be an easygoing person? We have another Mishnah later on 
that tells us to be flexible like a reed and not firm like a cedar. That's another uh, Mishnah, another rabbi. Here he tells us something a little bit different. Rabbi Shemuel Omer, have a kalna rosh, be easy going with those who still have dark hair. What does that mean? It means the young. Rosh, I'm sorry, I, I made a mistake. Have a kal le rosh, noach le tishhoret. Tishhoret is the dark hair. Kal le rosh means be easy going with the head. The head means the seniors, the senior citizens. Be easy going with people who are the elderly. You know, they may move slower. They don't cross the street as fast. Uh, they don't react as fast. Uh, they're not easy to, uh, to change. Rosh, people who are already more senior than you, you have to be calm with them, be easy with them, be light with them, joke with them a little bit. You know, they, they may, they've gone through life, so they have a different mindset. Noach, but be also easy going with the tishhoret, with those who have a black head, black hair on their head, meaning they're still young. They're energetic, they may have a little bit of chutzpah too, uh, they may have their opinions, or whatever, you know. What he's trying to tell us is be easygoing and light with all age groups, all kinds of people. Don't be a kapdan. Don't insist on your way. Don't try to be demanding. Regardless of the group that you're dealing with, the young or the old, just handle them. They're different. They're different, of course. The young is different. The old is different. You know, when it comes to teaching students, it's very different to, te very different to teach elementary school and high school. Different to teach kindergarten and secondary school. I mean, different ages, different challenges. Rabbi Ishmael is telling us, whether it's the young or the old, be easy with all of them. Why? Because it's important to train ourselves to be mekabelet kol ha'adam besimcha. You want to receive everyone, everyone you meet in your life with simcha, with joy, with a happy countenance. Here he's not talking about a poor man. He's not talking about somebody that comes to you and begs you that you have to respect, that you have to be nice to them, that you have to be patient with them. Here he's talking about the general people on the outside. You're meeting somebody in the street. We've, we've seen and we still see that the rabbis very much said, don't be the last to say hello, to greet. Be the first. You will see people in the street telling, oh, good morning, how are you doing? This he doesn't even know you. He's not even Jewish but he's being nice to you. That shows something about their nature. It's a very good thing to get used to. Hi, how are you doing? And by the way, you know, people, tellers, or people that work in communication on the phone, they go through training on how to be a nice to customers. Otherwise, they, these customers are not going to come back. A steward is also supposed to be going through this training. But some of them probably had a hard day. A long flight, you know. Imagine a stewardess in Elam. They must go through a lot of training. They have to deal with Israelis. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah. You have to deal with all kinds of people. <laughs> Try to get used to accepting everybody. Mekabel, in other words, greet him, accept him. <laughs> so this last point is a significant point because unfortunately, not doing so could lead to terrible tragedies. I'm not going to go through the whole story of Kamtsa Bubar Kamtsa, but that was the story of Tisha Be'av. Basically, somebody was not supposed to be invited, thought he was invited, and came to the party. And when his enemy saw him there, what are you doing here? I didn't invite you. Well, I'm already here. Why don't, you know, let me stay. I'll pay for my meal. No, I'll pay for half of the whole meal. No, I'll pay for the entire whole meal that you made here. Just don't embarrass me in front of me. He, he threw him out. That was the story of Kamsa and Bar Kamsa, if you know the story of Tisha B'Av. And, and the guy who was thrown out says that all the rabbis who sat there didn't say anything. That means they, 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 they approve of this. He went and snitched on the Roman authorities that the Jews are rebelling against them. And that brought down the, destruct, that brought the destruction of Beit The question is, that in itself caused the destruction? Obviously, not that alone. That's the straw that broke the camel's back. That is the the ma'aseh, the deed, 
which is representative of the entire generation of what they were guilty of. That is the example of Sinat Chinam, of not caring, of being disrespectful, of embarrassing, of not being sensitive. Shaming someone in public and come on, invite him, let him stay already, he came already. Big deal. Why we should be so macapid on that? Where's the, 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 the minimum of decency? Right? So that led to Chilul Hashem, Sinat Chinam. Terrible, terrible, terrible thing. And here he's telling us, be easy going. Just let it go, let it flow. Tizrom, as we say in Hebrew. How long does a person live? Why make such a big issue from these little things? One way to do it, perhaps, he explains, is through his last statement. When a person gets used to be mekabel people with simcha, the reason why that's so important and, and, and helpful is because he's not just talking about decency here. It is important to have derecheretz. Derecheretz means decency and behaving yourself properly with people in general, being nice. Here he's not just talking about decency. You know what he's telling us over here? When you are mekabel everybody besimcha, you're being respectful of every human being by recognizing that he has a tzelem elokim on him, that he has the image of God on him, whether he's from Bangladesh or from Zanzibar. Makes no difference where he's from. He's a human being. He has a tzelem elokim on him. Forget about, besides derecheretz, which means behave yourself, be, be nice, be, be a gentleman. Derecheretz is important. Here, he wants to train us, he wants to say, train yourself, get used to, train yourself to accept, to be not only accepting of everyone, he says, to receive them and to greet them because this will, of course, strengthen the kavod hazulat, the kavod abriyot in you, this will enable you to be more respectful and understand the, the, what the human being is all about, regardless of the differences between you and him, and when it comes to the Jewish nation, ze yotzer achava. When you smile, sit down, can I offer you a drink, right? When, you, when somebody's coming to your door, right? All of that, yotzer achva. It's no more stranger. It's unity, it's brotherliness. Wow, all because of what? Because of simcha, because of a smile. A smile, pshh, makes, does wonders. And guess what, I have some news to tell you. A smile doesn't cost money. <laughs> It's, it's for free to smile. You know, they say flat to, to, to give a compliment is also very special. Yes, but the fl a compliment takes a few extra words and effort, and you have to remember. A smile is a way of being. You don't have to remember. If, you, if we train ourselves to be like that, to be happy, and to not be morose and bitter, because that's contagious. Bitterness is contagious, and happiness is contagious. So if the two are contagious, let us hope that it is our happiness and our smile that should be contagious to all. Thank you.